Americas. They showed up and like colonizers before them, found lots of land and lots of people living on that land. Hmm, kind of inconvenient. These aren't real people, right? They don't actually own this land. You can hear the English people like sort of saying to themselves. So they came up with a new very useful tool. It was a mental tool. In addition to guns and smallpox and alliances with local tribes that helped them divide and conquer the locals, Europeans also developed a complex set of legal philosophies to convince themselves that these people were not in fact capable to claim any land. After all, they were foragers. They didn't farm. They couldn't own this land because they didn't use it for productive means. They were subhuman, or at least non-civilized, so they do not deserve to own property. Very clever, very effective. And so now you see the next layer of ideological thinking that was required for these Europeans to justify their land theft. It was the need to dehumanize the people living on these lands. Here's a letter from a British settler who describes North America as a wilderness, quote, where none inhabit but hellish fiends and brutish men. This dehumanizing paired really well with another ideology that was very popular at the time, Christianity. A religion that told its followers to go out and preach to everyone so that they can be saved. Perfect. These unrefined, brutish, fiendish men, and we have Christians who have the power to save them. Anything is possible now. So by the late 1600s, the but this tension is, is not new to Greenlanders. They've been experiencing some version of outside forces threatening their culture for a really long time. For a long time, it was the Danes, the colonizers here on Greenland, who came in looking to exploit this land and to modernize and industrialize this place. And with them, they brought prosperity, economy, industrialization, new forms of development, income. But in exchange, they brought with them an attempt to eradicate the culture here, forcibly shutting down some of these settlements, pushing the people into bigger population centers so that they could work in fisheries and factories, sterilizing the culture and even trying to thin the population forcibly stripping away any population from their land and then separating them from their friends and family would take a toll on any people. But for a culture so rooted in their natural environment, this rapid assimilation effort from the Danes has taken a particularly harsh toll on Greenlandic people. Very, very fast assimilation that um, a lot of people lose their identity. That was a mental violence so many of them just chose to become alcoholic to forget their problems. As I moved, these Europeans now had a leg up. They had new tools. Remember, they had invented capitalism to make them rich. That gave them time to do science, which gave them technology that they used to make their capitalism better and more effective, more productive. This cycle repeated itself over and over and over, giving Europeans a further and further leg up technologically. Until soon, they had stuff like this, a steamboat. You didn't have to worry about the wind anymore to keep going. You could just steam your way all the way up African rivers. On the old African queen. Or the railroad, a quick way to transport food and troops. Like you can see this map, all of this red is either railroads that they put in or railroads that they were constructing at this time. This allowed Europeans to level up not just in Africa, but everywhere. I mean, here they are in India. The British quickly taking over this entire subcontinent of what today is India and Pakistan and Bangladesh with this massive complex rail system that they built basically in no time. They also invented the telegraph, which could now relay messages in a matter of minutes instead of weeks. I mean, this political cartoon really personified how powerful this was. And of course, what we've been looking at this whole time. They made maps. Juicy maps showing the geography and the people and all of the land that they had conquered. In addition to technology, these empires had also perfected the art of allying with local power holders and turning the people against each other, divide and conquer, which allowed a small group of Europeans to control millions of locals. And of course, they had these.
these refined killing machines that allowed small groups of European soldiers to rip through truly formidable African armies. Like look at this painting from Sudan, where the British used their guns to slaughter 10,000 enemies with just a few hundred losses. And here this casual caption showing that these savages were now mowed down by these modern weapons of war, clearing way for civilization invent things like the new world and unclaimed land that actually belonged to them. They applied a lot of those same ideas to the slave trade. A lack of Jesus, a lack of white European culture and technology, making these people inferior, in need of saviors to make use of their land, their resources, and their bodies. By 1914, Europe had successfully taken over the world. In the spring of 1803, two American politicians visiting Paris closed the sweetest real estate deal they had ever seen. With the simple stroke of a pen, their country doubled in size, all for just $15 million. But in this deal, which was called the Louisiana Purchase, the US didn't actually buy this land from France. France didn't actually own the land. What the United States was buying was the imperial rights to this huge swath of North America. This basically meant that France would stay out of the way and let the budding new empire, the United States, colonize it without interfering. If the United States really wanted ownership over this land, they would need to get it from the people who were here first, which at the time was lots of different native tribes. These are the people who had been here for thousands of years, way before Europeans had the idea of leaving their continent. And this land that the US just bought was theirs. Oh, and this isn't just me, like some modern enlightened person looking back and judging the United States at this time. The US knew that this wasn't their land and that they were going to have to buy it from the people living there. And their big plan was to do things differently, not like the old imperial powers that they had just broken away from. In fact, George Washington was, quote, determined that the US government's administration of Indian affairs shall be directed entirely by the great principles of justice and humanity. Go USA, let's do this in the right way. So instead of conquest, they would negotiate and sign formal treaties with these native nations. Then they would pay them for their land, fair and square. After all, this was a country whose founding document highlights justice, tranquility, welfare, and liberty. In our series, How the U.S. Stole, we get to see how the U.S. grew from a group of English settlers to a global superpower. But none of those stories would exist without this one, the origin story the first thing that the U.S. ever stole. So Europeans are pouring into this newly formed country, the United States. And the government is making deals and signing treaties with the tribes, allowing these newcomer immigrants to settle on their land. At first, this is a fairly peaceful transactional process. The U.S. would offer food, farming equipment, cash, the services of a blacksmith, all in exchange for ownership over this land. But unsurprisingly, a lot of these tribes had no interest in moving out of their ancestral lands in exchange for, like, farming equipment. And this is where all of George Washington's ideals of justice and humanity really start to dissolve. The U.S. was becoming a more powerful nation. They needed more land for their booming population. So the impatient settlers and their government started playing dirty. The westward movement was like a great tidal wave. You start to see what happens when these tribes say no to the newly powerful United States. In one instance, one group of tribes up near the Great Lakes didn't want to sell their land. They told the United States that this river would be the border and to not cross it, to stay off land. The U.S. said no, and they took them to war and lost twice. But on the third time, they won the battle and forced the tribes to sign a treaty giving away all of this land, basically all of present day Ohio. Something very similar happened down here when the Seminole tribes refused to leave their land. The US military came in, another war killing thousands, forcing the tribes to sign a treaty and pushing them into the swampy interior of the state where they had no access to their farmland or the ocean. Down here in what was becoming Alabama, the Muscogee Nation refused to sign a relocation treaty, but not wanting to go to war, agreed to sell a portion of their land in return for a guarantee that they could keep the rest. And the United States agreed, and they actually did. And the Muscogee kept their ancestral lands forever. 
womp womp, no, that didn't happen. Four years later, a bunch of white settlers moved in, boxing the Muscogee out of their ancestral land. As tensions grew because of this violated agreement, the US military was called in to force the Muscogee out of their lands. No treaty was ever signed. I mean, the shenanigans ranged the whole gamut here. They would get tribal leaders drunk to trick them into signing this paper that gave them all the land. They would appoint random people to be the tribal leaders and then tell them to sign away the land for the whole tribe. In another conflict, the Sioux and Arapaho nations defeated the US military over and over until the US finally signed a peace treaty acknowledging their land. And they were safe until gold was discovered eight years later and the US broke their treaty, redrew the boundaries, built roads on their land, and before you know it, you've got a bunch of white guys with gold pans harvesting this land. Treaties and justice be damned. Eventually, other tribes caught on to what was going to happen, realizing that refusing the US government would mean violence. So they would sign the paper, take the money, and leave. Over the course of almost 100 years, the United States signed 368 treaties with tribal nations, who were driven out one way or another to make way for white settlers, who established control over this land that their government had stolen for them. And yes, you have all the paperwork, all the spreadsheets that they were making, all the a thinly veiled campaign for imperial conquest. Fake treaty shenanigans going on to help the United States feel like they're doing justice. And it's working. They are moving loads of native people out of their ancestral lands so that white people can settle it. But there was one region that proved particularly difficult for this extermination project that was going down. Here in the Deep South, you had these five large nations that lived side by side with the settlers for a long time. They had all signed treaties with the United States that acknowledged their right to this land. Many of them spoke English, practiced farming, wore European clothes, some even owned slaves. Because of this, these five tribes, the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Muscogee, and Seminole, were known as the Five Civilized Tribes. And there's an alternative world where these tribes could have remained on their land, living side by side with the Europeans as they settled. But that's not what happened, mostly because of cotton. <laughs> Farmers down here were getting super rich off of a very valuable cash crop called cotton that they could sell to textile mills around the world. It was an industry made even more profitable by its key input, free labor from stolen Africans. There was this one strip of land down here called the Black Belt Prairie that was particularly desirable for farming cotton. But as you can see, it was locked up in what the United States treaties had formally acknowledged as belonging to native nations. But the farmers down here were looking at this as like, this is a perfect place to expand our cotton kingdom. So these Southern slave owners did what was kind of becoming US policy towards the people living on the land that they wanted. They made up their own rules. The state of Georgia was particularly aggressive in trying to clear this land out, or in the words of their governor at the time, to replace, quote, all of the red with white population. They targeted the Cherokee Nation, passing a law that abolished their governments. The Cherokee are not going to stand for this, so they fight back using the same shenanigans that the United States is trying to use, the US legal system. They take Georgia to court, a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court, and guess what? The Cherokee Nation won. Like, there was no way around the fact that they had ironclad rights to this land, signed and sealed. The highest court in the country just ruled that the states could not impose on tribal sovereignty. But, as we all learned in government class, a ruling from the judicial branch only works if the executive branch enforces it. Oh, and who was in charge of the executive branch? Oh, this guy. The guy who wrote a letter to his wife during the War of 1812 from the battlefield saying that he had successfully slaughtered 170 Native Americans in quote, an elegant style. Oh, and the guy who's on our $20 bill. Yeah, him. Andrew Jackson thought that negotiating treaties with the people who were living here was a ridiculous notion. So he looks at the Supreme Court ruling that validates the Cherokees right to their land. And he literally responds in the snarkiest way possible saying, the Chief Justice John Marshall has, quote, made his decision, now let him enforce it. No, he was not going to enforce it. Jackson had a different plan in mind. It came in the form of a new law that he pushed through both houses of Congress. His whole worldview towards first Americans embodied in a piece of American legislation, the Indian Removal Act of 1830. 
This law used taxpayer money to get tribes out of the United States and to relocate them to an uninhabitable place that surely no American settler will ever end up. The Great Plains seemed an inhospitable land to people familiar with the eastern states and of Europe. This became their dumping ground, and it came with a promise. Move here and we will never mess with you again. And what's crazy to me is that even after all of the shenanigans, all the facades, they continued to play this charade, saying that the nation of Indians may choose to exchange their land where they now reside. The law says that the government had to negotiate these treaties fairly, voluntarily, peacefully, and that the government would, quote, forever secure and guarantee them their new land, and that they wouldn't break any of the pre-existing agreements that they had made in previous treaties. But no, this was just more pretending, a paper trail of pretend humanity. Jackson had ignored the Supreme Court ruling. He had no intention in following the law that he helped create but he kept up the ruse. More documents, more signatures, more paper that made these civilized, justice-minded people feel like they weren't orchestrating a mass ethnic cleansing, sanctioned by the government, paid for by taxes, but they were. So this law is implemented, and the United States government, military, and even private companies start to ramp up their removal efforts of first Americans. They focus in on these five tribes that were sitting atop the land that they wanted for their cotton empire. More bribes, more pretend negotiations, and when push came to shove, more threats of violence. The Cherokee eventually signed a treaty agreeing to sell their last portion of land, and they moved west out to their little rectangle of land that had been allocated to them by the government on maps. The only problem was that the leader who signed the treaty on behalf of the Cherokee people was not actually the real leader. They had no authority to make this decision. The Cherokee chief furiously protested this, but the US didn't care. They had their signature from someone. In their eyes, all was justified. Between 1831 and 1838, Nearly every member from the five tribes was expelled from their land. A hundred thousand people, whose home this was, now forced to walk by foot for more than a thousand miles through brutal weather and terrain towards a little box on the map, a place they had never been before. The Cherokee would eventually call this journey the Trail Where We Cried, or the Trail of Tears. Some tried to fight back against their oppressors, and others stood their ground until they were forcibly bound in chains by the US government and herded west at gunpoint. Their land was vacant, and cotton farmers with their slaves moved in, and the economy grew. We'll never know how many people died during all of this, how many lives were really destroyed. Some people say 3,000, other estimates say 15,000, but you don't need those numbers to see how destructive this was. It was systematic, it was documented, and it was enshrined in law. We have a paper trail of all of it, showing the receipts, the payments, the treaties, the bureaucracy of it all. It's like a bunch of spreadsheets from the 1800s. American settlers, in an effort to be different from the old world empires they fled, ended up carrying out the first state-sponsored ethnic cleansing. There's a reason why Hitler, a hundred years later, references this exact event, this process, when he was carrying out his own ethnic cleansing. He said that the Volga, which was a river in Russia, would be, quote, our Mississippi. He said that Europe, not America, would be the land of unlimited possibilities. The story of what happened to many nations of the first Americans doesn't end here. In fact, this is kind of the beginning. We're gonna make a second part to this video, and in that part two, I wanna show you what happens next once these tribes arrive to their little rectangle on the map. Indian Territory, the place where these tribes were forced out, dumped, and left to build a new life, and how they once again tried to fight back using the legal frameworks that had pushed them out, and how all of that led to the establishment of one state in our country that could have looked a lot different. Many of the Plains Indians were, after the Civil War, many of the Plains Indians were moved to Oklahoma. There's a place in the middle of North for the people. The story of checkered board maps and lines and private property and broken promises. All because of this. 
This place was a dumping ground for the people that the US government wanted to get rid of, which is why today it has the second highest number of first Americans of any state. It was once a random rectangle that the US government used to ship native populations after they removed them with a new weapon of state power, paperwork. Treaties and payments and spreadsheets. Pretend justice. That's the story we talked about in part one. The next part is how these first Americans created a state of their own, fighting against their captors to retain one last shred of sovereignty over their land, the land that had been taken from them over and over again. Taken from them over and over again. A frontier people had remade a continent. The United States of America. So remember in part one, I showed you how the US government used bureaucracy and a particularly horrible law to push out over 100,000 people, to push them off their land, many of them ending up here in a little rectangle that the US called Indian Territory. And crucially, in the process of kicking these nations off their land, the US government promised that they would leave them alone, that they could live in peace, rebuild their lives, relearn their land. So over the course of the 1800s, more and more tribes are exiled and arrive here to Indian territory. The territory gets divided again and again as these tribes are crammed into this one rectangle, which results in this map. And a reminder that each of these nations had their own government and culture and language, and yet they were all dumped in this one place and labeled Indian. So they ended up here knowing that it would be hard, but okay, at least we can rebuild a new life without the anxiety of white settlers unfairly claiming our land. Oops, nope, here they come. The westward movement was like a great tidal wave, sweeping westward past the Mississippi River. Over in the east, the Americans had now convinced themselves that it was their literal destiny to keep spreading west. And as they're doing so, they stumble upon this rectangle, this rectangle that they thought they would never reach. But no, they're not allowed to settle here because it's allocated for Indians by treaties, like real ironclad treaties. Okay, but wait, here in the center of this map, you see this little section. What does that say? Here, let's look at a different map. Oh, unassigned land. Let's settle here. When the land was thrown open to white settlers. And by settle, I mean not like buy the land or sign anything. Just show up to this empty looking flat area and just settle. Soon, these imperial squatters are farming the land. They're building a life, a society in the West, but right in the heart of the territory that the US government had signed treaties promising to first Americans. Oh, and by the way, I'm just gonna get this out of the way now. Maps around this time start to show this weird little panhandle that doesn't make any sense. Literally called no man's land because nobody really claimed it. And then a bunch of in here because there was no law. Anyway, someday I'll go into that one. We're talking about Indian Territory, and word soon gets out that this place is the new trendy part of town. The federal government is kind of hesitant, like, wait a minute, we had promised these people this land, like, let's just back off. But the squatters kept coming and clamoring, and soon there was a railroad that was built that went right through here, bringing even more settlers. And finally, the government was like, fine, you can move in and settle in this one little section of unassigned land in the middle of Indian Territory. But it's going to be first come, first serve, and so we'll make it a race? Yes, a race. Like, literally, there was a race. There was a starting line, and there was a gunshot, and 50,000 settlers hungry for new land in covered wagons dashed forth to claim some of this 2 million acres of unassigned land in hopes of getting cheap property and starting a new life. The tidal wave of Europeans continues. They're hearing about these mystically huge plots of land in the West, the American dream. As unassigned land started to fill up, the settlers started to look around at all of this land that, yeah, technically had been promised to the natives, but they weren't really using it to farm. So like, no harm if we just sort of set up shop here, right? So they kind of start doing this and the government has to get involved. So in 1890, they draw this line. It cuts Indian territory in half, leaving all of this, as well as the random no man's land panhandle, to become a new territory. They would call it Oklahoma. 
So Indian Territory now is just this land for the five civilized tribes. That's what the federal government called them. But all the tribes that had lived here were now in the new territory of Oklahoma and their land was suddenly up for grabs. And once again, here come the maps and the documents and all the stuff that basically made this feel like it was official and right. A lot of these maps have squares on them. Look at these. And here come more of those. And they would find out where native families were living and allow them to stay there. But everything else was up for grabs. The signal was given and the race was on. And here come more of those weird races, four more in fact, each bringing in floods of settlers into this land that had been promised by treaty to somebody else. And look, these maps start to fill up with names. Alice, Roy, Julia Delage has this square. These are people coming from Europe looking for the American dream and finding maps full of squares and land to claim allotment. This real estate boom came with a marketing boom as well. Indian land for sale. Get a home of your own. Easy payments. Possession within 30 days. And look, they're advertising that here in 1911 that they have 350,000 acres available for sale. There is so much land up for grabs. It was the same thing as much land up for grabs. It was the same thing as before, what we talked about in the first video, but just happening again in a different place by different people. It was maps and documents and bureaucracy cutting down native sovereignty and culture square by square. With all of this carving up, settlers square by square. With all of this carving up, settlers start outnumbering the indigenous people. The five tribes were still technically safe from all of this allotment for a time, but they saw what was coming. They had learned time and time again that the United States government, for all of their treaties and promises, never actually kept the agreements that they signed. And they were right. Soon, there was a law passed that said that all tribal governments and tribal courts would be abolished by 1906. So as a last ditch effort to fight back, the five tribes gathered and devised a plan to salvage some shred of their sovereignty. This was a time when US territories were making proposals to be states and new states were popping up left and right. So if these tribes wanted to band together and make a state of their own, this was their time. They called the state Sequoia, in honor of the man who created the Cherokee writing system. And so the year before all the tribal governments were to be abolished by law, the tribes held the Sequoia Constitutional Convention, where hundreds of spectators gathered to watch the delegates create and write a constitution, complete with a bill of rights, trade regulations, tax policy, county borders. And by the end of it, they had produced this 35,000 word document separated into 18 articles, 270 sections, that had everything they needed for a proper state. It was unanimously ratified and in a public vote, overwhelmingly endorsed by the citizens in Indian territory. And honestly, if you read this document, it's kind of a story. From the population to the economy to education and taxable wealth, they deserve to be a state. But then they appeal to the humanity of the government that had done so much harm to their people, their culture and their home. They appeal to this, quote, natural right of people to govern themselves, quote, by the fact that we constitute a separate and distinct community from any on earth with a different history, associations and ideals and hopes. These people had been boxed out time and time again, and now they were appealing to the values of these Europeans who had taken their land, using their language and their legal tools to make the case for their statehood. Okay, so now with their well-formulated constitution, their solid proposal, their maps, all of it in hand, the tribal leaders went to Washington ready to lobby for a state. And Congress didn't even look at the proposal. Like they didn't even look at the, like they didn't even like look at it. It wasn't like a debate. It's just like, they just were like, no, of course not, not. It was like dead on arrival. 
But of course, they wouldn't throw away all the work that these tribes had put into Sequoia's constitution, so they just sort of took it for themselves. The Oklahoma constitution is basically word for word what was written in Sequoia's constitution. One historian called it, quote, the ultimate cut and paste job. So this is what Oklahoma looks like. And they reserved one small chunk for the native people to govern themselves up here. So just as a quick recap, time lapse, People who had lived here for thousands of years went from roaming freely around all of... So just as a quick recap, time lapse of the whole thing, remember that first Americans, the people who had lived here for thousands of years, went from roaming freely around all of this to being driven out and dumped into this rectangle and then eventually cut in half and then gridded up square by square and sold to then being further reduced to this. Today, there are 39 recognized tribal nations in Oklahoma, but just one of them has a reservation. Now listen, this is one little shred of the history. One of them has a reservation. Now listen, this is one little shred of the history of the people who lived on this land. This same process happened all over the country as Europeans moved to every corner of the continent. After first Americans were boxed out and lied to and relocated, the United States government eventually settled on this. This is a map from 2020 that shows every federally recognized reservation. There are 326 of them. But remember that this number leaves out the tribes that we talked about in this story. But then later that year, 2020, something big happened. A Supreme Court ruling found that the treaties that the U.S. had signed with the Muscogee, Cherokee, Choctaw, Seminole, and Chickasaw nations, promising that they would leave them alone in Oklahoma, those were legitimate treaties. And that those treaties had been broken when the U.S. government just drew all of them into the state of Oklahoma. And thus, all of this land that was set aside for the five tribes during the whole relocation was in fact still tribal land. So what does that mean? Well, what it means at first is that Google Maps shows these borders, these borders that we've been looking at, these borders from the treaties in the late 1800s. But if nothing else, it makes crystal clear how much of a charade all of this justice was back in the day, all of the treaties, all of the legal processes of different peoples, how our government policy successfully created the concept of Native American, of Indian, hundreds if not thousands of different peoples with unique cultures, languages, and histories, and relationships to this land, all lumped into one category on a spreadsheet, drawn into boxes, the perfect place to continue to whittle away at their distinct identities, to erase their story, one broken treaty at a time. There is a cluster of 7,000 islands that looks like one of the most beautiful places on Earth. People have been living here for over 30,000 years, traveling between these islands, trading with each other and with the region, and developing religion, identity, and culture. It eventually became a country called Ma'i. And while all of these advancements were happening here on these islands, another group of humans had been evolving in another part of the world, over here in Europe. But this other group had a different culture, a different religion. Many of their advancements were achieved through expansion, not collaboration. And their religion thrived when they stomped out others. They wanted to conquer. These island, these people, this culture would soon be swallowed, stripped of what made them them. And soon their name would be changed after the name of the king of their conquerors. This isn't a story just about a big, powerful military taking over new lands. We know that story pretty well. The story of these people offers a new perspective to anyone who will listen. It's a perspective that has been wiped from our history books because of the inherent discomfort and tension with this fact that the United States, once a colony that heroically threw off an empire to become independent, soon became 
an empire itself. It contradicts our founding belief that it is, quote, self-evident that all men are created equal. And this story isn't just history. That empire still exists today with colonial possessions and subjects. It's all wrapped up in the story of these 7,000 islands and their people. So I want to tell you the story of how the U.S. stole the Philippines. There is uh, another story of these guys. It's always these guys showing up from Europe. So the year is 1770 and humans have been living on Australia for like 70,000 years. But despite this, you get this guy who shows up and quote, claims possession of the east coast of Australia for the British crown. Soon, a bunch of British people are showing up to Australia to set up their own colony. And this is where the whole pristine, unique ecosystem thing kind of starts to fall apart. So in addition to what these British people did to the native people who were living there for 70,000 years, massacres as systematic as those practiced against the Jews in the 20th century. The other thing the Europeans did when they arrived here was they brought all sorts of plants and animals and a desire to do farming, all the agriculture stuff that they had been doing back in Europe. Meanwhile, Australia's 120 year old ecosystem is like, Ugh, like SMH, like we had perfectly balanced our ecology and these guys are bringing camels? They also start growing a ton of non-native plants like sugar. And when they started growing sugar, there was one native species in Australia that was very excited. That native species looked like this. It's a grayback beetle who was stoked about the fact that these British people were, were growing sugarcane. So they just started to feast on all these sugar farms. So now the Europeans, now independent Australians, instead of being like, hey, maybe we shouldn't grow sugar here because every time we grow it, it gets infested by these beetles. Instead, they're like, let's go to Hawaii and get a bunch of frogs. The idea is that the frogs would eat the beetles and then the beetles would go away, right? But no, the, the frogs, or the cane toads specifically, had no natural predator in Australia. So they just exploded in their numbers, and they became a pest in and of themselves. ...is the more recent influence of the United States. Okay, so it's the end of the 1800s. Up until now, U.S. expansion sort of looks like this. It's all happening on this mainland. And at this point, there sort of became a big debate of like, do we keep going? Some people wanted to keep expanding the US outside of this mainland. The president at the time wasn't a big expansion guy, but he was surrounded by people who loved war, specifically this guy. And these people who surrounded the president had their eye on this Spanish colony right off the American coast called Cuba, where the locals were rising up against Spain. Wait a minute, isn't this a video about the Philippines? Why are we talking about Cuba? We're getting there in just a second, okay? So anyway, Cuba. Americans didn't want to go to war with Cuba. They're like, we don't need more war. But thanks to the explosion of an American submarine in Cuba, which was probably an accident, and thanks to some highly unethical journalism that blamed the explosion on Spain, and a big thanks to, again, this guy, Teddy Roosevelt, who at this point was just a peon. He was literally the assistant secretary of the Navy. But he somehow cajoled his boss's boss, the president of the United States, to go to war in Cuba to like liberate the Cubans from Spain. So the US declared war on Spain in 1898. But this begins a new era of war in the United States. No longer can you just go into war and just like take over land. You need an angle. You need to sell the war to the American people. So the angle on this war was liberation. We are liberating the people. The people you liberate will witness the honorable and decent spirit of the American military. No, 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 that's, that's later. We're talking about 1898. But yes, the whole idea of selling war to the American public didn't really go away after this. Why did the U.S. go to war in Iraq? In the early stages of military operations. So anyway, the U.S. is now at war with Spain, which is an empire that is deeply in decline, as I mentioned. It's not gonna be hard to win. But soon, it's not just Cuba. The U.S., really meaning Teddy Roosevelt, who again is just an assistant secretary of the Navy. He's like not a big decision maker. He somehow maneuvers the situation to say like, let's liberate next door Puerto Rico. And while we're at it, let's go into the Pacific and liberate Guam and the Philippines from Spain as well. Teddy didn't even ask his boss to do this. He literally sent off a cable to the Navy commander in Asia that was like, George Dewey, go attack the Philippines where Spain is. That is what your mandate is. And George Dewey's like, okay, 
I'm being told to go to war with Spain and the Philippines. Teddy was sort of of the mind, like, better to ask forgiveness than permission. I mean, I get that, but kind of nuts that he pulled it off. Anyway, and now because of Teddy Roosevelt, who we literally named the teddy bear after, side note, we are at war not in the Caribbean only, but also in the Pacific. The U.S. arrives to the Philippines and sees that the locals had already been fighting against the Spanish for, like, years. The Spanish were weak and were totally declining. So it's like the top of the ninth inning, or like the fourth quarter of the Spanish in the Philippines. And the U.S. shows up and is like, let us liberate you. And the Philippines were like, well, we've sort of already been fighting this bloody war for years against the Spanish. So yeah, I guess, United States, if you want to come help us deal the final blow to Spain, like, sweet. So George Dewey, this Navy commander, and his fleet show up to Manila. Meanwhile, back in the U.S., people are like, wait, weren't we just supposed to invade Cuba? What are we doing in the Philippines now? And the U.S. government's like, because the Philippines is a perfect hub for commercial opportunities in Asia, and we think that if we don't take it, Japan or Germany might take it, which would clearly diminish our geostrategic advantage in the Pacific. No, they didn't say that. They said, we want to liberate the people of the Philippines. Liberate. The people you liberate will witness the honorable and decent spirit of the American military. So the Spanish see the U.S. arrive to the Philippines and they're like, great, we're done. So the Spanish military commanders ask to meet with the U.S. military commanders. They meet in secret and Spain's like, listen, I know we're losing, but we really want to save some face here. We don't want it to look like we lost to the Filipino revolutionaries. And I'm not kidding, the Spanish commander literally said that he would, quote, be willing to surrender to white people, but not to the Filipinos. So the US commander's like, okay, there's an opportunity here. We said we were here to liberate the Filipinos, but we haven't promised anything yet. So we would much rather it look like the US defeated Spain instead of helped the Filipinos defeat Spain. Much better for our brand, says the United States. So together, the United States and Spanish militaries organize a fake battle a fake battle in which the U.S. would fight the Spanish in Manila and the Spanish would intentionally lose. And the climax of this whole theatrical battle, according to the plan, was that at the end, the U.S. would storm towards the inner walled city of Manila, the last stronghold of where the Spanish are. Oh, and the key detail in this whole plan, they would not let the Filipino fighters, the ones that had been doing all of the actual fighting against the Spanish, join them as they stormed towards the walled city to deal the final blows to the Spanish Empire. And this would mean that the Filipinos technically didn't gain their independence. It was actually the U.S. who conquered the Spanish. And then the Spanish were like, oh, can you give us $20 million for our troubles? And the U.S. was like, yeah, sure. So now the U.S. wins the war and they claim sovereignty over the Philippines. So yeah, this happened. They did the fake battle, they won the war, and instead of liberating the Filipinos, they just say, hey, we're your new colonizers. Psych. Meanwhile, back in the United States, they gotta keep up this white savior liberation narrative that they created to justify going to war with Spain. So you see a lot more theatrical PR by the government. They staged this giant military parade in New York City where this military commander who did the fake war, George Dewey, marches down. They called it Dewey Day. It was like a two-day parade in New York City. They created a big like military arch for him. He became like a military hero for having like liberated all these people from the Spanish. And then you start to see these like crazy advertisements like this soap advertisement that has George Dewey, the commander, washing his hands with the caption, quote, the first step towards lightening the white man's burden is through teaching the virtues of cleanliness. And on the sides, you have soap being offloaded in the Philippines and being given to the locals. The U.S. had to frame this not as conquest, but as the honorable duty of the U.S. to civilize these people, or in the words of the soap ad, quote, to brighten the dark corners of the earth. Jeez, this is insane and was not that long ago. Okay, so this is where things really heat up. It's 1900 now, Spain loses the war, obviously, and the US now owns Puerto Rico, Guam, and they claim the Philippines. But the local Filipinos who have been fighting for their freedom for years are like, no, 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 no. You just waltzed in here on our rebellion and conspired with the Spanish to make it look like you were liberating us. No, this is our country. We don't need another colonizer. And this is where things really heat up.
the Filipinos start fighting again for their independence, and this time against the United States. It is a pretty horrible, bloody war, one that I never learned about in school. It includes massacres of men, women, and children by the United States, and hundreds of thousands of civilian deaths. But the U.S. eventually won, and they established a government in the Philippines. Back in the U.S., the appetite for expansion continued to go down and people sort of just forgot about the Philippines. They forgot that there was a war there. One newspaper summed it up by saying, Americans didn't know if the Philippines were islands or canned fruit. But the fact remained that the U.S. went to war and now owned the Philippines, in addition to Puerto Rico and Guam. So this begged a very important question, one that hadn't been asked before, which is, is all of this land America? Are these people Americans? This was a huge question. And the answer to that question affects how we see these territories still today. Okay, so a few years after these wars, there's a guy in New York City who's importing oranges from one of these territories, Puerto Rico. And he's paying tariffs on these imports because, you know, that's what you do when you're importing oranges from another country. Wait a minute, another country? This guy was like, didn't we conquer Puerto Rico and Guam and the Philippines? Isn't that America? The, the Constitution says that you can't put tariffs on stuff coming from other parts of the U.S. Like, New Jersey can't put tariffs on, like, avocados from California. So he sued, and his case, and a bunch of others like it, made it to the Supreme Court. So now the Supreme Court must decide, is this land where we just won a war, is this America? Are these Americans? If they are, do they get all the same rights as other Americans? Do they get to vote? Do they get to participate in the US economy without tariffs, like any other state does? And honestly, this isn't a question about oranges and tariffs. The real question at stake here is, is America the land of the free where all are created equal, or are we an empire? No different than any other empire that scoops up colonial possessions in war and rules the people, who are usually black and brown, as subjects, not fully a part of the country. That was the question that was at stake. And in this series of cases in the early 1900s, the Supreme Court decided that America was the latter. Is the latter. They created a new category of land called unincorporated territories, where the people don't have any representation in the democracy, but where Congress could create laws on their own, particularly laws dealing with revenue, which would not be allowed by the Constitution for states within the Union. We can create revenue laws, stuff that's totally unconstitutional for other parts of our country. In other words, unincorporated territories are land we control and exploit for revenue, but whose people don't get to vote and don't get the right to trial by jury. So yeah, the Philippines, in addition to Puerto Rico and Guam, remained unincorporated territories, a place that the U.S. could kind of just ignore without a lot of consequence. They weren't important enough or strategic enough to be considered to become states like Hawaii or Alaska. So they sort of faded from American consciousness. Like, this is why we never heard about this in school. Like, it didn't make it into the history books in any salient way. And how far the Philippines had faded from people's minds became very clear in December of 1941, during World War II. The U.S. had owned the Philippines for, like, 40 years, when a fleet of Japanese bombers flew across the Pacific and bombed an American naval base in Hawaii. <laughs> But what we don't really remember is on that day, Japan bombed Guam and the Philippines, two American territories, as well as several other American and British territories. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Here's the draft of this speech. This is the original draft that FDR spent the day marking up before he gave it. Zoom in a little bit and you'll see on this draft that it mentioned the Philippines originally, but FDR crossed it out. He crossed out the mention of Manila. Yes, the Philippines was on some map somewhere. Yes, we technically owned it, but the people really didn't want to hear about it because these people weren't Americans. The Supreme Court had decided that. They weren't gonna become states anytime soon. So why mention them? After that day, Japan actually full-on invaded the Philippines. They didn't do that to Hawaii, but they did to the Philippines until the end of the war, at which point the Philippines were finally granted independence in 1946. Fast forward to today, 
and this we own you but you're not really Americans precedent established by the Supreme Court still applies to 4 million people who live in unincorporated territories. Or let's just call it a spade a spade, let's call them what they are. These are colonial possessions. The people who live here don't experience the full rule of law. They don't get trial by jury. They don't have full representation in our democracy and they don't get to vote for the president. This is why when a hurricane hits Puerto Rico, the government response is not nearly what it should be. The way Trump talked about Puerto Rico as almost another country, as not a part of us, mirrors exactly how the Supreme Court talked about these unincorporated territories. They're for revenue, not to compete with American farmers. We conquered these places, but we didn't want to bring the people fully into the American project. We left them out. And there they remain today. Three borders that blow my mind and that help us learn about how far countries will go to control land and water. So let's do this. It's easy to forget that the U.S. still has colonies. But we don't actually use the word colony. We prefer words like unincorporated territory or commonwealth. These are places where people are subject to U.S. rule, but don't enjoy the full rights that other Americans do. I want to tell you about one of them, Puerto Rico. When you're in Puerto Rico, you're not just in a vacation paradise. You are in a part of the United States. It feels like the United States, but it also feels distinctly different. This feeling, this limbo state, didn't happen by accident. In fact, it's perhaps the best example of the lengths the United States has gone to hold on to land. So let me show you how the US kept their colony in the Caribbean, using brute force, spying, and the abuse of land and people. This is how the US stole Puerto Rico. You're sure it's pure. At the same time, US banks descend on the island, giving out very predatory loans and then foreclosing on land, gobbling it up and turning it into, you guessed it, sugar farms. Puerto Rico is slowly turning into a sugar island and becoming more and more dependent on shipments from the mainland. The US enacts a new policy that says that anything going into Puerto Rico has to be transported by American ships with American crews. So of course this skyrockets the prices for locals, which is made worse by the fact that the US government had devalued and then outlawed the local currency. So now every Puerto Rican lost almost half of their wealth overnight. And as a part of this push to lock Puerto Rico in as their colony, they forbid Spanish in schools and public institutions. And so in this very short amount of time, the US turned Spain's former colony into this giant sugar farm, stripping down local identity and language and culture in the process and locking the people under their control. And then Congress gives Puerto Ricans US citizenship, which conveniently was just in time for a giant global war. So Puerto Rican men got sent to the front lines to fight for the country that was in the process of pillaging their island. By 1922, a series of Supreme Court cases had solidified Puerto Rico as a, quote, unincorporated territory, which is just like word salad for the US Constitution doesn't fully apply here. I mean, think about it, unincorporated territory, this intentionally contradictory jargon that came from these men hundreds of miles away. But honestly, the message was very clear. Puerto Ricans did not look or sound enough like Americans to actually be a part of the United States. By the 1930s, big banks owned 60% of these sugar farms, 80% of the tobacco farms, and 100% of the railroads and shipping facilities. At the same time, Puerto Ricans were being paid less than four cents an hour. If you put that into today's currency by inflation, that's like a dollar an hour. Poverty and malnutrition start to grip this island. All the while, the US is turning the island into an essential military outpost. See how Puerto Rico juts out a little bit into the Caribbean? It served as a strategically positioned island to help protect trade routes and a place where you could refuel ships. Over time, more and more military bases and installations start to pop up on this island. The US would go on to test thousands of bombs in Puerto Rico, leaving behind one of the most hazardous waste sites in the United States. And by the middle of the 1900s, Puerto Rico really starts to mirror what the US envisioned. Puerto Rico, the sugar metropolis. Puerto Rico, the land of low wages and abundant laborers. Puerto Rico, the irreplaceable military outpost. 
the empire that billed themselves as the liberators from Spain is now an overlord, and the locals start fighting back. The fight is led by this guy, Pitt. This poor kid who ends up going to Harvard, he graduates valedictorian from Harvard Law School. He serves the US in World War I and even helps draft Ireland's independence constitution. Like the guy's kind of a superstar. Ultimately, he returns to his hometown to attempt the impossible, Puerto Rican independence. But soon, Campos would find himself bouncing in and out of prison for 25 years. Cuando los adultos de la patria tienen que ser de salir despavoridos de sus lares, no tienen siquiera salida a países extranjeros distintos del poder enemigo que nos oculta. Tienen que ir a Estados Unidos a ser los esclavos de los poderes económicos de los tiranos de nuestra patria. Things haven't quite escalated. This movement is just starting. Campos comes back to Puerto Rico with the goal of total separation from the United States. And people join him. A lot of people. Just everyday, ordinary Puerto Ricans who are fed up with being exploited. They join them, they organize, and they call themselves the Nationalists. They run for office, they go on strike, and they fight back against this superpower that has been exploiting them. Momentum begins to pick up. And then the dominoes really start to fall. There was this American doctor. His name is Cornelius Rose. They control people. I've never seen this before. It starts with FBI agents who come to the island to work with the police of Puerto Rico. They have one simple mission, to spy on anyone who they deem politically subversive and to sabotage them and thus sabotage the independence movement. So they spy on everyone. They spy on the nationalists who are part of the movement, but also their friends, their partners, their sexual partners, their business colleagues, their children. They track down criminal records and mistresses and debtors and creditors and photos and license plate numbers, school transcripts, and even the guest list to weddings. Like they got really, really detailed. They started listening in on phone calls and intercepting letters. Everything was fair game. The idea was to create Panopticon, this idea that they're always watching. They also started to cultivate relationships with a network of informers. Often the victim's family or friends or neighbors would get sucked into this state spying apparatus. The FBI uses payments and coercion and manipulation, which often forces people to turn on each other, causing divorce and broken friendship and fractured communities. Much of this was done undercover, like these FBI agents would just be dressed in normal clothes, but would be constantly surveilling the people around them. Oh, and we know about this because they documented everything. If you were a person of interest, you probably had a file. All of these files, they're called the carpetas. Our story producer, Rafaela, went to San Juan to see the carpetas firsthand. So I'm at the General Archive building in San Juan in Puerto Rico to see these secret surveillance documents that were collected on thousands of Puerto Ricans over so many decades. After weeks of work, I finally got to look at las carpetas to see what was actually in these files. And it's kind of creepy, I have to say. You see specific times and dates and details from meetups, detailed descriptions of the locations where people are just meeting, all of the names of people involved, these subgroups that were potentially supporters of the independence movement. You get these highly detailed physical descriptions of the people that they were tracking, their occupation, the model of their car, their license plate number, and all of their moves, all of their activities, what they were doing, who they were supporting. And even for those who moved away from Puerto Rico, they continued to track them, knowing exactly what apartment they lived in in the Bronx. They speculated about their nationalistic tendencies. And then you see these interviews that agents were having with people close to the target, where their personal beliefs are revealed, like one who thought that Puerto Rico would be repaired with socialism and independence. You can see a source telling these agents that they're afraid that their friend had become friends with the leaders of the independence movement and had been inducted in because of this friendship. And of course, these informants request that all this information they're spilling to the agents, quote, be kept secret. These agents would even interview family members. Like there's this whole transcript of the agents talking to the mother of someone who was suspected to be a part of the independence movement. Oh yeah, and in all of these documents, you see an obsession with who had guns. It's hard to overstate 
overstate how exhaustive this spying effort was and how powerful it was. The FBI was able to use all of this information to intimidate and blackmail and punish suspected nationalists. I mean, there are thousands of these examples from children being like kidnapped and put into a helicopter by the FBI to people being denied government jobs, all because they had a carpeta. At the end of the day, it was psychological war against Puerto Ricans who wanted independence. And it worked horrifically well in dividing these people and making them feel powerless because they were always being watched in their most personal of moments. Oh, and it wasn't just a couple of years. This lasted for decades. Puerto Rico never got independence. And to this day, they remain an unincorporated territory, which means that they don't have the same rights as other American citizens. And the status of the island is a heated debate. Many Puerto Ricans value the modern day benefits of being connected to the US, but at what cost? So let's get some context really quick. It's like 1900 at this point. The US is really starting to like get a handle on this whole imperialism thing that they've been doing. They just fabricated a war with Spain, which led them to conquer the Philippines, Guam, and Puerto Rico. They had just overthrown Hawaii's government. They annexed Wake Island and American Samoa. They're like, dude, this overseas empire thing is kind of working out for us. The president at the time was Teddy Roosevelt, who we've seen in previous episodes. And Teddy is looking around this region that the US is in increasingly taking over. And he sees an opportunity to dramatically increase the naval power of the United States if they could just unite the Atlantic and the Pacific. It's time to build a canal, says Teddy. So of course they looked somewhere in Central America. And the original plan that the US wanted to pursue was to build a canal not in Panama, but here in Nicaragua. It wasn't the shortest stretch of land in this area, but there was a huge lake here which would cut down on the digging and it just made a lot of sense. So they started doing surveys and making plans to build build a canal in Nicaragua. Meanwhile, Philippe, the Frenchman, is still down here at his failed project, and he's seen the US become interested in the canal, and he's like, this is my moment of vindication. So he goes to the US Congress, and he's like, hey guys, I know you're looking at Nicaragua, you've been doing all this site planning and surveys and stuff, but guess what? Right next to this proposed site for your canal, there are volcanoes, big, scary, belching volcanoes. And one of them just erupted around here, sort of next to your site. Nicaragua even had a postage stamp that featured one of these nearby volcanoes erupting. So the Frenchman goes around to the US senators and distributes this postage stamp and says, look, scary volcanoes in Nicaragua, don't build your canal here or they'll be destroyed by lava or or something. And guess what? It totally worked. The US Senate got cold feet about their Nicaragua canal plan, and they're like, we're not gonna do this anymore. Let's find another place to build it. And Philippe is like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that just worked. <laughs> Stamps with volcanoes. He's like all giddy, and he's like, hmm, I wonder where there would be a good place to build a canal. Oh, wait a minute. Why not Panama? We, the French, already did a ton of work to get you started. Why don't you just pick up where we left off? We'll sell you all of our gear, all of our stuff. It'll be a great deal. And the US is like, but isn't Panama a part of Colombia? And yes, indeed, at the time, Panama was actually a part of Colombia. It was not an independent country. So the United States Congress is like, okay, listen, Philippe, we will buy you out of your canal project that you clearly failed on, but we will only do it if we can get approval from Colombia, who literally owns this land. And Philippe is secretly like, ugh, there's no way that Colombia is going to go for this. They're gonna reject the plan, and then the US is gonna back out, and I'm gonna lose all my money, and I have to make this happen. Philippe was very serious about this canal. So this is where Philippe starts to get really conniving to pull out all the stops to get the canal built. So he goes to the people who live in the region of Colombia called Panama, and he says, hey guys, I know you've sort of been wanting to be independent from Colombia for a long time. Bogota is so far away, they don't care about you. You could be your own country. What if I, a French engineer, could guarantee your independence without a bloody war? Just leave the details to me. Make me your ambassador and I will make this happen. And the Panamanians are like, but dude, you're French. And he's like, yeah, 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 but you're Colombian. So why don't we team up in the name of creating Panama, a new country. And they were like, okay, fine, Philippe. You're our representative, our ambassador now. Just give us the signal when we should rise up for our independence. But you promise to make sure that Colombia is not gonna come in and quell our uprising. And Philippe's like, yeah, 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 I'll take care of it. 
Philippe is now the ambassador of the Panamanians who are not a country yet, but he's still hoping that maybe the Colombians will approve the plan. Philippe sort of has this in his back pocket, this deal that he just made with the Panamanians. He doesn't know if he has to use it yet. But back to the Americans having to ask Colombia for approval to build their canal. Sure enough, they show up and Colombia's like, no, go home. You guys are way too aggressive around here lately. We're not interested. No canal. See you later. So the U.S. goes to Philippe and they say, sorry, bro, the deal is off. Colombia said no. We said we'd only do this if Colombia said yes. After all, Panama is a part of Colombia. And Philippe is like, wait, hold on. I have a plan for this. I've been talking to the Panamanians and they want to break away from Colombia. And they made me their ambassador. I've even written them a new constitution and designed them a new flag. Wait, Philippe, are you a graphic designer? No, but I designed them a flag anyway. We can still make this canal thing happen. All I need you guys to do is show up with your navy to make sure that the Panamanians can rise up for independence without Colombia coming to shut it all down. And the US Congress is like, dude, you're nuts. See you later. But out of nowhere, the president at the time shows up and is like, did somebody say stage a theatrical revolution to take over more land and increase American power? Teddy was back on the scene. Teddy loves this kind of stuff. He loves the sort of like backroom deals. Let's like not ask for permission. Let's ask for forgiveness. This is like Teddy Roosevelt's like sweet spot. So Philippe has all of his ducks in a row. He's got Teddy Roosevelt on his side. He has Panamanians who just gave him approval to be their ambassador. And he's like, let's do this. So in November 1903, Philippe gives the nod to the Panamanians to rise up, to take over and declare themselves independent. And at the same time, he signals to Teddy Roosevelt to send in their big gunboats to sit off the coast of Panama to block Colombia from sending in reinforcements to put down this revolution by the Panamanians. And so Colombia is like, oh, pfft, fine, take it. F you, America. You guys played real dirty there, okay? You know that? That was not cool. So just as Philippe orchestrated, Panama declares independence and Philippe is the ambassador. The US is the first to recognize them as a new country. And Teddy Roosevelt's like, that was thrilling. Now what, Philippe? So Philippe is like, let's make a deal, America. I'm the official representative of Panama now, as per my agreement with the Panamanians. So let's write a treaty on behalf of Panama. So he travels to the United States and starts working on a treaty between the United States and Panama that would give the USA the rights and sovereignty over this strip of land to build a canal. I mean, this series of events is insane. France fails to build a canal, so one French dude, an engineer, tries to redeem the whole thing by convincing the US to change the location of their canal and then creates a revolution and convinces the US to help back that revolution so that he, a Frenchman, can be the ambassador of the newly created country of Panama and make a deal with the US. Whoa, Philippe. He was like the one man band lobbyist who somehow like finagled this whole situation. So Philippe and the Secretary of State of the United States draw up this treaty. It gives the US total control over this strip of land for them to build their canal. No Panamanians were in the room when they drafted this treaty. They gave no approval of this. This treaty was between the US and Panama, but really it was between the US and Philippe the French engineer. So now the US military shows up to Panama to like claim this land that they now see as theirs. And the Panamanians are like, dude, WTF, what are you doing here? And the US is like, oh, you signed a treaty with us giving us all this land. And Panama's like, no, we didn't. And then they're like, oh, wait, light bulb. Philippe, that's why he wanted to be our ambassador. I get it, man, we got played by Philippe. And they totally did. So now the US is setting up shop in Panama to start digging their canal. One Frenchman orchestrated all of this. He played all the geopolitical forces at the time just right. He used Panamanians thirst for independence and the Americans thirst for imperialism and ocean power all to make his dream of this canal happen. Oh, and to secure his financial return on the project. What a wild story. Thanks for watching. I mean, it's no secret that powerful countries spend a lot of time and resources trying to get a leg up militarily, trying to find the next big technological thing. Like you can actually find patents from the US military that claim to revolutionize propulsion tech using like anti-gravity spacecraft, like really out there, wild, weird, theoretical tech that may or may not exist. Again, another rabbit hole I'm not gonna go down. He's like, this region, Central America, looks like a great neighborhood to control the supply chain. 
They wanted to control the people who worked on the farm by owning their basic survival needs. They wanted to control the houses they lived in and the stores they shopped in and what they could buy. They wanted to control the transportation by building railways so that they could quickly ship their product onto ports. They wanted to control the boats and the waterways so that they could get all of these bananas from Central America to the US before they spoiled. They started with Guatemala pouring tons of investment into controlling every inch of their supply chain. Soon, they were the largest company in Guatemala. They owned a fifth of the farmable land in the country. They owned all of the railways and all of the radio stations and radio infrastructure. And by 1901, the government of Guatemala actually hired the United Fruit Company to manage the country's postal service. What? United Fruit was starting to look a lot like a government, and the result was a lot of happy, banana-eating Americans. So they kept going. They kept expanding their operations across Central America. So now with all of this beautiful infrastructure and trains and land, the next strategy for making bananas even more profitable was, you guessed it, paying the workers next to nothing. Oh, and paying them not with real money. A lot of the times, United Fruit paid their workers in vouchers. These vouchers could only be used in designated United Fruit commissaries. So they're not actually making real money here. So wait, now the United Fruit Company has its own currency? Oh, and they also had like a private navy, 93 boats called the Great White Fleet. But then eventually they started using these boats to like transport people on cruises. These boats were even used during World War II. United Fruit started to look like a literal government. They had their hands in everything, so much so that they earned themselves the nickname El Pulpo, which means the octopus in Spanish, meaning they had their tentacles in everything all over Central America, the land, the crops, the people, the infrastructure, and soon enough, government agencies. Soon these countries became so dominated by and reliant on the United Fruit Company that they were no longer run by the people or the governments. They were run by American banana companies who had all the power and leverage in the world. This led to the nickname Banana Republic, which is a politically unstable country whose society is exploited for profit for one single product, in this case, bananas. Yeah, and probably not the best sort of thing to name your clothing store after, like just a thought, but like, who, who, who made that decision? United Fruit and other banana companies continued to grow and control Central America. Eventually, people got tired of this. In 1911, Honduras was like, all right, we're done, banana companies. Like, we're gonna take back our land. We can take it from here. These are our plantations. You've gone too far. Banana companies didn't like this. So they organized a private army to help overthrow the government so that they could put in a president that they liked who would allow them to keep doing exactly what they were doing and also give them a tax break. So yeah, banana companies are now overthrowing governments. Jeez. This kept happening. Anytime there was political dissent or the governments of these countries started to like step up and say like, no, the banana companies would intervene. And guess who had their back? The US military. And yes, we're back to Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt, what a guy. Here's Teddy stomping around the Caribbean with his big stick, making sure that American military and business interests are protected. In Honduras alone, the US invaded seven times in the early 1900s, all in the name of protecting these banana companies and other US interests from having to face these pesky locals who were so audacious as to want to run their own country. How dare they? And if you remember that, at this time, the US was starting to get really comfortable with empire behavior, and Central America was at the top of the priority list. The banana companies knew this, which allowed them to feel emboldened to just sort of do whatever they wanted in the region. Okay, but this is sort of child's play. It started to get a lot worse in the 1920s. There was a situation in Colombia where a bunch of workers for the United Fruit Company decided to stop working and protest their working conditions. They were asking for a few things like, I don't know, working six days a week instead of seven or getting paid real money. The United Fruit Company refuses to negotiate with them and instead goes to the US and says, hey USA, 
We've got these really annoying workers who are like trying to unionize and trying to get paid and stuff. And it actually smells a lot like communism. And the US is like, wait, what, communism? Tell me more. So then the US threatens to invade with their Marines and squash this strike if the Colombian military doesn't do something first. Reminder that we're not talking about some big political revolution or rebellion. We're talking about a few workers in a banana plantation protesting for more humane conditions. And yet this was a priority for the US government to put pressure on Colombia to fix the situation. Of course, Colombia didn't want to make the US angry, so they responded and sent in their own troops to go put down this workers' strike, and they were ordered to, quote, spare no ammunition. So on December 5th, 1928, these protesters are in the town square in this town in Colombia, and the Colombian army shows up and massacres them. Men, women, and children were killed by their own military, all because an American banana company didn't want to pay them a decent wage. I mean, this is madness. It is madness to think that these large geopolitical forces were coming to bear over a banana plantation. This event is called the Banana Massacre. This didn't stop in 1928. Fast forward to Guatemala in the 1950s. At this point, the United Fruit Company, El Pulpo, is making major profits. They own almost 50% of the land in Guatemala tax-free. But this president, Jacobo Arbenz, who was democratically elected, is trying to change things. He wants to take land that United Fruit owns but isn't using and redistribute it to poor Guatemalans. He's sort of doing like a Robin Hood thing, trying to like lift poor Guatemalans out of poverty. But of course, United Fruit didn't like this. But instead of engaging directly with the Guatemalan government, United Fruit goes to the White House and says those magic words again, communism. United Fruit then hired this PR magician, who happened to be Sigmund Freud's nephew, and he worked with news agencies to create a bunch of fake stories that linked Arbenz, the president of Guatemala, to communism. Completely fake news. And, and not just like using that word lightly, like he created a fake Guatemalan newspaper, created all these fake reports, and then distributed those fake newspapers to Congress. He planted the seeds in their minds that the United Fruit Company were the good guys and that Arbenz, the democratically elected leader, needed to go because of communism. It totally worked. President Eisenhower, the president of the United States, believed all of this and he sent in the CIA to get Arbenz out of power, to protect the banana people once again. So it's a classic CIA coup. They go find a bunch of rebels, they give them money, and they train them. Rebels rose to oust Guatemala's red infiltrated government. They find a leader who wants to be the next president that's friendly to the US, and eventually they start broadcasting anti-government propaganda, and they turn Guatemalans against their government with all of this fake news and propaganda. They send the Navy in to block Guatemalan waters, they send some bombs onto Guatemala City, and then they invade. And then with these trained fighters, they go take over the government, the Guatemalan army surrenders, and the leader of the rebels becomes the new president, friendly to the United States. And now the banana companies are happy and they have a guy in power that is their guy. It's like, it's like a, they have a playbook on how to like mess with democracies around the world and they just sort of followed the playbook. They're like, oh, we, we've done this before. We're gonna do it again in Iran in a little bit. Like this is like classic, classic CIA coup. By the way, this coup was sort of a death blow to democracy in Guatemala. It divided and destroyed the budding civil society that has not allowed Guatemala to recover since. All because these banana companies wanted to control the, the supply, supply chain. chain. These things leave scars, major scars, major marks on a country. Scars that are still felt today.